Welcome back to Dominic Brunet's course on celestial navigation. My name is John Pinto and I'm a mathematician and amateur astronomer and I'll be presenting Dominic's course. You can find more information about Dominic's books and course at marinenavigationbooks.com where you can find out how to order the books, uh, download some resources, including the slide deck for this presentation. Today is episode 11, and we will be covering what was the solution that was decided upon uh, for the problem of longitude, um, and who won that longitude prize. So as I had mentioned, one option was to try to find the time using something in the heavens, say time from the moon. So we know the moon uh, moves approximately 360 degrees in just 30 days, or about 12 degrees per day, or about half a degree or 30 minutes an hour, which is pretty quick uh, against the background of the stars. Uh, that's equivalent to a uh, half of a minute of arc per minute. Um, so if you could measure that fairly accurately, that would you know, probably give you a, a good uh, approximation of time. Another option was to look at the satellites of Jupiter, which um, cross uh, the um, disk of Jupiter at various times for each of the different satellites. So if you could uh, you know, look up an almanac when, say, Callisto uh, transits Jupiter and you set your clock to that particular time, again, you'd have a fairly accurate uh, measure of time. The other option was to create a mechanical device, as I mentioned, some kind of a chronometer. And the man who uh, proposed that solution and, and came up with a, with a good chronometer was John Harrison. Now, I will tell you that there's an excellent uh, movie that was made about uh, this topic, uh, showing the um, competition between the astronomers and Harrison, and Harrison's son who got, also got involved. Um, it's called Longitude, appropriately, and it's based on the book by Davis Sobel. So uh, if you ever get a chance to look at that, that is a really, really good uh, movie to put you into the mindset of the people at the time and how important this was. So Harrison made a couple of different chronometers. Um, obviously, all of these things had to work at sea. Uh, on a pitching and rolling boat. And that turned out to really be the difference between the astronomer's solution and uh, Harrison's solution. Um, so he had made chronometer number one. Chronometer number two, from what I understand, did actually go to sea um, and worked very well. But as you can see, it was very large and cumbersome. Um, and uh, it did actually work. But again, it was um, sort of impractical. It was more like a prototype. The chronometer that actually won the longitude prize um, and tested by Captain Cook in 1769 was Harrison's chronometer number four, which, as you could see, was a very portable. Um, I believe this was about, I'm going to say, sort of like a wall clock size. Um, and they actually have uh, copies of this. Uh, in the uh, at the Greenwich Observatory, if you ever get a chance to go there and, and see it. Um, amazingly, uh, they have some of these chronometers still functioning and still uh, keeping very accurate time. So why did Harrison win? Well, it turned out that on a pitching boat, it's very difficult to time either the uh, transits of the moons of Jupiter or to measure where the uh, moon is in relation to the stars. They, the, the, the motion of the boat is just um, too difficult to, to take those measurements. Now, I will tell you, those types of measurements were made on land. So, for example, when Cook was testing the chronometer uh, against the uh, ast astronomical um, ideas, what he would do is he would uh, land at, at some particular uh, island or offshore, uh, uh, sorry, or uh, on some coastland of, of, uh, of a continent, 
he would go on shore and he would actually do the astronomical measurements to determine the time. And then he would compare them to the chronometers that he was carrying aboard. And uh, using that is how he uh, kept the chronometers in sync and could measure their, their accuracy. So yes, it was Harrison who won. And he did eventually claim the longitude prize after a very long struggle because, of course, the astronomers ran the longitude board. <laughs> they, of course, wanted their solution to win, so they were it took them a long time to pry the money out of him. But I believe he was in his 80s by the time they finally did pay him the, the prize money. And then he died, I think, a year or two later. So he did see the money come into his family, at least, uh, and his son, from what I understand, uh, did a, a good business in, in producing chronometers. So one of the things you do have to deal with, as I was mentioning with uh, Captain Cook, is you do have to deal with um, chronometer error. Now, that's really not a problem as long as you know exactly what rate the chronometer either gains or loses time. And then you can figure that into your um, calculation for what the actual time is. So <clears throat> chronometers have either an error curve, or some people call it an error rate, that you establish before uh, you leave uh, on your voyage. So you you know you check your chronometer you know every day for a couple of weeks, and uh, you determine how it uh, gains or loses uh, so many seconds uh, per day, or so many seconds per week, and then therefore you can when you see the uh, the time on your chronometer, you know how long it's been since you left port and, and synchronized your chronometer. You uh, adjust the time by either the seconds you've lost or gained, and then you know the exact uh, time it would have been uh, back at port. So in order to establish the exact time, the no total number of seconds of error need to be calculated since the day of departure, as I said. This is your chronometer error, and it does accumulate during the trip. So for example, a chronometer is fast and has accumulated a total of three minutes and six seconds of error after a month at sea. What is the actual UTC time when the chronometer reads 1401.04 UTC? Well, the chronometer is fast, so we need to remove that error, so we have to subtract the extra three minutes and six seconds of time that the chronometer uh, pushed us forward because it was fast. So we uh, take our chronometer time and um, <clears throat> we want to subtract three minutes from it, but of course you can't subtract three minutes from one minute, so you have to uh, s steal a minute, uh, uh, sorry, you have to steal 60 minutes uh, from your time to get something greater than three minutes. Um, and then, then you would be able to subtract your time and get the real time. So here's some exercises you'll find in the uh, exercise book that you can check yourself and see that uh, you understand this concept. In our next episode, we will be using time to measure longitude. So we will take everything that we've learned and try to apply it and do some exercises and uh, see, help you to wrap your mind around the, co the concept of how intimately time is related to longitude. And we'll see you next time for, for those exercises. Thank you very much.